Hi. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Yonatan. I'm a PhD candidate in the ECE department here at UCSD. And Professor Weibel asked me to give this week's talks about behavioral context recognition. And this is a key aspect of how to make technologies more ubiquitous or more disappearing in the background. The idea is that the system should be smarter and more aware of what is going on, more aware of our behavior. So I'll give this talk uh, from my own perspective as a fellow student and a researcher in this field. So I'll start by explaining how I got to work on this research field and what is context recognition. Then I'll describe research on context recognition systems in three different aspects. First is the sensors used and the context that are recognized, the input and the output of the system. The second aspect is the AI ML, artificial intelligence and machine learning tools used in the internal mechanism of the system. And the third very important aspect is data and validation, how to collect data to validate the system. Throughout these three aspects, I'll uh, present some previous studies and each study suggested some kind of solution and we'll discuss the trade-offs. Every solution has its strengths and has its weaknesses. And especially I'll emphasize on our solution here at, the, uh, here at UCSD with this code word extrasensory. It's going to repeat throughout the talk. Uh, the last part of the talk will be about the application. What is it useful for? What can you do with context recognition? And this is the most uh, relevant for, for you in this class, in the class project you're going to design and implement an application that uses context recognition. And specifically, you'll be using the extrasensory app, which is a tool that we developed, and I'll discuss it later. <clears throat> when I came to UCSD, I didn't even plan on working on context recognition. I uh, joined Gert Lankrit's lab at the ECE department because I was very passionate about music, and I was excited to work in that lab about, uh, to work on music data, to work on analyzing audio content, audio signals, and developing algorithms for music recommendation. So uh, last week, Professor Weibel played you a song by this artist called Björk. I don't know if you remember, but Björk is a kind of a kooky and very unusual musician, and she likes to explore and experiment with uh, new sounds. Now, I personally adore Björk, and uh, in a music recommendation system, I would love it if the, that system would help me discover new music and listen to new songs by Björk, for example, that I really like and I, songs that I never heard before. So that is one aspect of music recommendation systems to discover new music. But on the other hand, there's a time and place for Björk and it's not all the time. For example, when I'm working and I need to concentrate on reading a paper, I cannot have Bjork's experimental sounds in my ears because it's just going to distract me and annoy me. So I would like the recommendation system to be smarter about that and to realize that it's not relevant at the moment to recommend Bjork and instead it would recommend something more relaxing, more simple. And uh, that's the, the next step, that's context awareness. This property means that the system uh, adapts its behavior according to our behavior, according to our context. <clears throat> and Gert had the high-level vision and perspective to realize that music recommendation algorithms have reached some kind of saturation and they were always static, recommending the same thing at, at, this, at every time. And that the next level is going to make these algorithms more context-aware. So he suggested uh, for me to work on that problem. In order to make the system context aware, you first have to solve another problem. How is the system supposed to recognize what is going on? What is the current context? And that's how I got to work on that field. In parallel, a fellow student called Kat Ellis uh, in our lab, she worked together with Professor Jacqueline Kerr in the public health department, and they worked on exploring relations between physical activity, like sitting, running, lifting weights, and um, chronic diseases like cancer or diabetes. And in their work, they utilized mobile sensors to track and monitor the physical activity of patients. So all these directions combined together, and the lab decided to pursue 
the direction of context recognition in a unified framework that would later serve various different applications like music recommendation or health monitoring or aging care or rehabilitation from surgery. Now, other than physical activity, activities like sitting versus running or walking, what other activities or other behavioral aspects do you think are relevant that can help the music recommendation system recommend more relevant music? I'm asking you. Give me suggestions of other activities, other... Sleeping. Sleeping, for example. When you're going to sleep, you want to hear some kind of music. What else? Driving, when you're driving, you may have a feel for some kind of music. Yeah, working what else? Out. What? Working out. When you're working out, you may want to have something uh, upbeat. Yeah? Like dancing, like something dancing, okay. What about other aspects of behavior other than what you're doing? Also relevant, what? Yes? Being happy, you want happy music? Happy, happy, unhappy, so your mood, your emotions. And there are many other aspects of behavior, like your social interactions with other people, who you're with, where you are, are you in a restaurant, are you at home? So there are different multidimensional aspects to describe behavior. And all these different aspects can be useful for various applications like music recommendation. So in our uh, study, we were ambitious and we wanted to, we aimed to recognize a wide range of behaviors in different aspects of behavior. And I call this, in general, behavioral context recognition. Now, research on context recognition systems involves many components. This may seem like a lot, but we're going to go over all these different components throughout the talk. Uh, the part which is surrounded by this green rectangle you can think of that as a context recognition system. It has its input, the sensors that are used. It has its output, whatever it predicts or recognizes the contexts. And it has its internal mechanism, some kind of intelligent mechanism, the artificial intelligence part. And this whole system is supposed to serve some kind of application. It's supposed to provide something useful or desirable, something that someone would like to use. The artificial intelligence component has to be trained using machine learning methods. And in order to do that, you need data. And data, you need to collect it. So there's an important aspect of how to collect the data. And you use the data also to validate your performance of your system. So we'll go over all these different components. Let's start with the sensors used and the context, the input and the output of the system. And throughout the talk, oops, yeah. I'll present different works and I'll present the, the brief reference here, but uh, these slides are going to be on the website and towards the end, almost the last slide, there are the full references. So if you see anything interesting, by all means, I recommend that you look up the full reference and read the paper. So which sensors to use? A lot of sensors uh, exist today and they all they are multimodal from different sensing modalities. They sense different physical or virtual properties. And um, one example is to use stationary sensors. So in this work by Tapia, they equipped a home environment with a lot of stationary sensors fixed to cabinets or appliances. These are binary state change sensors. So a, se a sensor would turn up every time you would turn on a a stove or open a faucet or flush the toilet or open a cabinet. So imagine this house equipped with all these sensors. What do you think is the potential of this system to recognize? What kind of activities or behaviors can we recognize about the person living in this home? Yep. Like their schedule, like their routine. Their routine schedule, their daily uh, schedule. Like what kind of, uh, for example, what kind of uh, activities or routine activities at home? I mean, like if he wakes up in the morning, like he washes his face first and he takes a test, something like that. Okay, the time you wake up, your uh, usual uh, grooming time or washing the face, brushing teeth, preparing a meal, all kinds of different activities around the home. Do you have any idea what can this be useful for? What are potential applications of such a system? Yeah. Automation of what? Of um, all the different uh, systems around the house, so security system. Okay, so system. a smart home application that can automate, for instance, if you're used to drinking your morning coffee at a certain time, 
It can learn to, to do it automatically for convenience. And other applications uh, involve supporting people with special needs or aging care people, helping them age at home in their own environment. That was stationary sensors. But a lot of research go for mobile sensors that go wherever the person is going. And a popular sensing modality is acceleration. In this work, they used accelerometers. They placed them in different positions on the person's body. And what do you think, what kind of activities can you track or recognize with this kind of system? Yeah? Types of exercise. Types of exercise, OK. If the person is, yeah. Um, types of locomotion. Locomotion, yeah. If you're walking, running, and some even more specific activities like brushing teeth, they aimed to, they targeted also watching TV. Um, what are potential uses of such an, uh, what kind of applications can use this, these recognized activities? If you track a person, how much they're walking, when they're walking, running, brushing teeth, what kind of uses are to that kind of system? Okay, like a calorie counter to measure how much exercise you do, possibly track your, your diet or eating habits. There are many different types of applications. Other sensing modalities, I'm just going to give brief examples. Uh, audio, for example, in this work, they had a microphone on the neck, sensing all kinds of bodily uh, sounds. And uh, this work by Kat Ellis, who I mentioned before, where they used both accelerometer and uh, location, GPS, to track people's not only locomotion, walking or running, but also if they're in a vehicle, in a bus. And this work by Hermes, where they really pushed it forward and had this system with many different modalities, including skin conductance and skin temperature and accelerometer and magnetometer and a briefcase with, uh, with audio recording and GPS. So they were able to target all kinds of activity, and such studies really pushed forward our knowledge of how to use different sensing modalities and what potential do these modalities have to have information about different activities. But is there anything wrong with it? Do you see any weakness in such an approach? What do you think of this person with all these sensors? Yeah. It's inconvenient. It's inconvenient. Right. So, Another line of work was to promote the system being more practical and more convenient and thus more ubiquitous. Like this work by Chudhori and her uh, partners, uh, they developed the mobile sensing platform and they had several uh, principles where, that they stated are important in a ubiquitous uh, context recognition system. It should have a, a small device, just a single device in a single position on the body. And this device should have multiple sensing modalities. It should be wireless. It should have a long battery life. So they suggested these principles and they developed this particular system. But what about other devices? Can you think of other devices that are ubiquitous, are unobtrusive? They have multiple modalities and they're already natural to use every day. Yeah. Glasses. Glasses. OK, glasses can be used every day, but today they're not so popular. I mean, smart glasses are not so everyday used. Yes? Cell phones and smartwatches. Smartphones and smartwatches, yes, that's uh, the next direction. So other studies used smartphones and smartwatches. They're carried around everywhere by the users. They're very intimate devices, and they're getting more and more equipped with a lot of different sensing modalities. So they're a very nice agent for recognizing context. Now let's do the opposite uh, exercise. In this work by Guiri, they targeted such activities and also as the person indoors versus outdoors, what kind of sensors do you think they used? Sensors that are already built into smartphones and smartwatches. Yep. Accelerometer and GPS. Accelerometer, GPS, right. What else? Microphone. The microphone, audio, I'm not sure if they used here, maybe, but that's also available. In, uh, in smartphones, right? So they used a lot of different uh, sensing modalities. 
Microphone, maybe not microphone in this work, but in this work, yes. So this is our work, uh, extrasensory, and we also used smartphones and smartwatches. We recorded measurements from all these different modalities, if they were available, not every smartphone has them. And we were, as I mentioned earlier, we were very ambitious. We wanted to, we aimed to recognize a very wide range of uh, contexts and to represent them in a more rich way to describe behavior in a multi-label way, where multiple labels can apply at the same time. For example, I can be running at the beach, listening to music, and with my dog at the same time. <clears throat> okay, let's talk about the next component of the context recognition system, the clever or intelligent component inside the internal mechanism, and how to train it, the machine learning methods of how to train it. So artificial intelligence is a broad term that has a definition that's always changing throughout the decades. I can generally define it as a machine performing some kind of intelligent task. And this task sometimes tries to imitate some cognitive function that every human does very easily, like understand speech. Sometimes the intelligent task uh, tries to perform something beyond average humans, like play chess at a champion level. And sometimes the task is inherently non-human, what, like what GPS does. I mean, I don't know any human or animal that's able to analyze radio signals from satellites and exactly infer the location on Earth. But I do consider it an intelligent task. There are different approaches to AI. Uh, the AI system can be more explicit, followed by, by a set of rules or a set of formulas, or it can also be implicit and based on data, and that's what machine learning does. What's in the picture? A bow tie. What else? <laughs> a cat. Thank you. Wow. Three seconds that took you? Okay, but three seconds, that's still very efficient. You're very good. Can I ask you, how did you do it? How did you determine that this is a cat? Face. The face? Okay, that's a little abstract and blurry. It has a face. I have a face. I'm not a cat. But it's distinctly a cat face. How? What are the rules? The cat has ears. Yes. We have a conception of a cat in our heads, and we're matching that with what we're doing. Okay. Have you ever seen this particular cat before? We have a general description. A general <laughs> description. Okay. My point is that sometimes it's not so clear to define clear rules of how you're performing a task. But we can still do this very efficiently because throughout life we've been exposed to thousands of thousands of examples of cats. And many times we also had a supervisor, like a parent or a teacher, telling us, this is a cat, this is a dog, that's a house. And that's the approach that machine learning is taking, learning from examples. Specifically, I'll be talking about supervised learning, where the task is to learn a classifier that's a function from a feature space to a label space. For example, in this illustration, the feature space is a two-dimensional plane, it's R2 and the label space is binary, either positive or negative, either plus sign or minus sign. And in machine learning, a classifier has a predetermined structure, but it also has some free parameters that you can fine tune during the learning process. So the structure can be, for example, you decide that the classifier is going to be a linear separator, like this line here. Linear separator classifies everything on one side as positive and everything on the other side as negative. And how to select the particular linear separator, that's what uh, training is for. That's what machine learning is for. You need a training sample that's a set, a collection of examples with their feature vector and their correct label, positive or negative. And the learning algorithm goes over the sample, it goes over the examples, and outputs the selected classifier. Like this particular linear separator with this slope and this intercept. Now let's do a small exercise. Uh, suppose that 
you're working, your feature space is R2, and you have this training sample with six positive examples and six negative examples, and you decided that you want to work with linear separators, which classifier would you prefer, B or C? C. Okay, why? Okay, this is kind of easy. You would prefer C because you want to fit the data that you have well. And B has some kind of errors. It has negatives on both sides and positives on both sides. So the first goal is to fit the data that you have well, to fit the training set well. How about this classifier? Do you prefer D or C? And notice that D is no longer a linear separator. We can say it's a polynomial separator maybe. Okay, Marlon prefers C still. Why? Look at how neatly it fits all these negatives and then it fits neatly the positives here. It's too tight. Okay, it's too tight, right. It's too specific. So if we have limited data, we'd usually prefer selecting the simpler model. And the notion here is to avoid overfitting to our uh, particular data set that we have because we are, well, we are aware that the training set we have is just a sample and eventually we would like the classifier to classify new unseen examples. How about now? How about I give you some more points? Do you still want to use classifier C? Do you still want to use a linear separator? Maybe not. So if you have more data, you may feel more confident to use a richer or more complicated model like this polynomial model. So these are uh, very basic concepts in machine learning. Let's go back to context recognition system. The AI system gets as input uh, measurements from sensors, but these measurements are often very unstructured. They can be from different sensing modalities and from each sensor the measurements look differently and they can have different durations or variable length. So usually a typical um, architecture starts with a step of feature extraction where you extract selected features into a feature vector and then you feed the feature vector into the classifier that outputs the recognized uh, context. For example, in our work, extrasensory, we worked with various different sensing modalities from the phone and from the watch. <clears throat> and obviously from uh, every sensing modalities we have to extract different features. So we decided to take these uh, statistical features from accelerometers and to take MFCCs from audio and that's a place where the researcher can incorporate some expert knowledge or some expertise from years and decades of work that told us that MFCCs are very useful to process audio for a lot of different tasks. Another option is to use feature learning. So that was feature design. Like I decided with what kind of features I want to extract. An alternative is to use feature learning sometimes with deep learning from the raw measurements, but it's mostly applicable when you have plenty of data. And in this field of processing sensors to recognize context, I'm not sure we're still in that level of plentiness of data that we can confidently learn the features. So the next step after feature extraction is the classifier and in different studies researchers suggested different classification models like this instance based classifier called K nearest neighbors. Are you familiar with that classifier? Uh, okay, some of you are. That basically how it works, it holds the, the entire data set and whenever there's a new example that comes along and it's unlabeled of course, we compare that example to all the examples in the data set. We find the k nearest neighbors, like the 10 uh, most similar examples, and we declare for the new example that its label is the most popular label among these 10. So what do you think of this approach? What is nice about it? What is strong about it? Yep. It can grow with more data, and it will consistently grow, like scale very well, and because sensors have like data which might be kind of near in like spatial locality and like Okay, you mentioned uh, grow with more data, but I don't think that's specific to this algorithm. You also mentioned scalability, and this is not exactly scale well with data. 
when I think of complexity. Okay, let's say one thing that is, I could say a strength about this approach is that it's elegant, you might say. It's simple, it's simple to implement. It doesn't require real training. You just use the data as it is. And what are weaknesses of this approach? Okay, so like what you mentioned, but let's mention it as a weakness <laughs> about the scaling. And I'm referring now to complexity of, of the system. When you have larger data, you will need larger space to store it. So it may not fit for uh, mobile applications. And you also need a lot of computation or runtime to process it. So for every new example, you need to compare it to all the examples. So if you have more examples, it scales badly and it may not fit uh, real-time applications. And another thing is that it assumes that you'll find some similar example. So a lot of studies that were conducted in a lab with repeated uh, behaviors used that approach and saw some successful uh, results, but it may um, make the task too easy. So if you take the classifier and try to apply it to real data out in the world, it may fail to find a very similar example. Another uh, approach used for classifiers is to design some kind of task-specific classifier, like this work by Heminki where they targeted recognizing transportation mode, so their classifier, they decided to first check if the person is stationary or on the move, and if they're on the move, is he or she walking or in a vehicle, and so on. Or this work by Hermes, where they predefined, the, they handcrafted this structure, this hierarchy of the predicted activities, and each of these small nodes, binary decisions, was solved by using a small classifier that was trained with machine learning. So these, appro uh, these um, approaches may be very fitting to specific applications, but it's harder to scale these to more applications and to more, um, to more context that you want to recognize because they are tailored to specific context. So uh, do you have a question or just yawning? Okay. <laughs> uh, so other studies use more generic uh, models for classification that you can train with any kind of label that you want. And specifically in our study in extrasensory, in the first paper, which should be available publicly uh, this month, uh, we started with presenting a very simple baseline based on uh, linear classification, particularly logistic regression. We extracted features, as I mentioned before, from six different sensors, total of 175 features, and then we feed these features into a logistic regression classifier that outputs a decision and also a probability estimate, like the probability that you're walking giving the measurements or the probability that you're in a shower giving the measurements. So in this baseline, we had a separate model for each label. And in the second paper that should be published in December, we used a more complicated uh, model called MLP, a multiple layer perceptron, so in addition to the input layer of the features and the output layer of the predicted probabilities, it has also hidden layers that mix everything together. So we showed there's an advantage of using a single unified model with shared, label, the shared parameters to recognize all the different labels. And in this study, we also addressed uh, various concerns of working in the wild, like having data that is very unbalanced and incomplete and you have missing labels and you have missing sensors. So we incorporated different methods to the machine learning component to how to handle such a data in the wild. Let's go talk now about data. As I mentioned, data is important both to train the artificial intelligent component and to validate the component. Because at the end, you're going to have to have some to declare some kind of score of how well your system performs. You're going to have to tell your customer, my system uh, uh, re recognizes context correctly like 80% of the time or better than an alternative system. And it's important how you collect the data. Data just doesn't just grow on trees. It doesn't just download from the internet. You need to collect it. And 
earlier studies collected data in a lab setting in controlled conditions. They would invite participants to the lab on schedule time to a designated location. They would position the devices on particular places on the body and they would instruct them. They had a script. They would instruct the person what to do. They would observe it and these scripts would be repeated by different participants. Now what do you think of this approach? What is strong about this approach and what are the weaknesses about this approach? What's strong about it? About having a lab controlled conditions. Yes. Okay, it's consistent. So you can get good uh, prediction results. So it helps you better narrow down what is informative about what. It's easier to do the prediction. You have another oh, comment? Anything. Okay. So um, when you have controlled conditions, you can better control to have a cleaner data. Everything is consistent. You can control the balance among the different labels. You say you want to collect 10 minutes of running on a treadmill, 10 minutes of walking, and you have reliable labels. You know that in these two minutes, the person was running because you told them to run. But what are the weaknesses of such an approach? What are you missing when you're collecting data in the wild? Uh, sorry, in a lab. Okay, so you're missing on some richness or um, combinations of activities that you can do at uh, the same time. You have another um, point? If there is homogenous data, it's the same over and over again. Okay. It would be like you would have trouble putting new tasks in the context that aren't in the script. Okay, so uh, you have the same data repeated over and over again, so it can be, like we said, a strength because it's easier to work with it and to get the prediction. But it's also a weakness because at the end you would like to train some system that works in the real life, in the wild. And you're going to misrepresent all these rich behaviors that happen in real life. And you're making classification, maybe you can see it as too easy for yourself. And these classifiers are not going to generalize well to the real world. So other studies took the data collection outside of the lab, like these two works, the work by Gunti and the work by Khan where they handed a phone to their participants and the participants collected data for several weeks from their own homes, their own natural environments, on their own schedule and the, the, the activities recorded were unobserved and uninstructed. So that is a big step towards more natural and authentic behavior. But still in these work they, they handed a research phone to the participants so it wasn't it was a foreign device, it wasn't the personal phone. They told them where to keep the phone, like in the pocket or a front pouch. And they also prescribed a list of targeted activities. So they told them, we're interested in collecting data from watching TV and from vacuum cleaning and washing dishes, where the person maybe is not even used to washing dishes. So there's still a little of, of uh, unnatural behavior in this approach. And in our projects, in our research, we want to promote what we call in the wild conditions of behavior. So we define these four different conditions of how to maintain behavior in the wild. Uh, first, the devices that you use should be naturally used device, everyday use device. Specifically, we use the person's own personal phone, which is the most intimate uh, device to them, and they're already using it every day and an additional uh, smartwatch, which is natural to wear, so it adds little burden. We didn't tell them where to place the device, so they were free to use the phone as convenient or as they're used to. They collected data from their own natural environments, be that at home or at work or commuting, and on their own schedule for approximately a week. And their behavior, uh, the behavioral content was natural. I mean that we didn't target a specific list of activities and instead we provided a more comprehensive, longer list of possible uh, labels, context labels. We asked them to engage in their regular routine and to report any labels that they think fit what they were doing. So we get a more individual, authentic behavior. Each pe person focused on what they're used to doing. 
so we're again ambitious. We want to collect data while maintaining in the wild conditions. What do you expect are going to be difficulties or challenges in that approach? Sure. Potential missing data. If okay. For whatever reason. Potential missing data. You can sometimes have technical problems like one sensor is not working, someone decides to take off the watch, location is not available. That's a, a very important consideration. That is one technical difficulty, yes? Unlabeled and mislabeled events. Unlabeled and mislabeled events. So you're going to have uh, to deal with the fact that you're not going to get labels for everything. And sometimes there may be mislabeling because we're going to rely on people that label. The labels are going to be less reliable than in the lab when you're telling a person what to do. So these are all considerations you, you have to face. And indeed, the, the label aspect of it is the, the harder challenge here. How to acquire labels when you're collecting data in the wild. We don't have an instructor telling them what to do. We don't have an observer or spy following one 24-7, um, following the participant. So what kind of ideas do you think are going to be used to collect labels? Yes? Self-reporting. Self-reporting, right. We're going to rely on people reporting about themselves. Um, okay, there's no use waiting. Let's, let's go on. Let's talk about other solutions that people suggested, researchers suggested for collecting labels. One approach was to use researchers as annotators and use a camera device like this work where they had this sense cam hung around the neck or a GoPro mounted on the chest. It would take snapshots of the scene and later on offline the research assistant would look at the images and annotate what's going on. Like here, there's a toothbrush, there's a toothpaste, and the context is brushing teeth. So what do you think of this approach? What is strong and what is a weakness about it? Yeah? I, I didn't hear that. What? Right, privacy is a, is a big issue. When you're using researchers as annotators with images, then you're violating the privacy not only of the participant, but also of other people surrounding them. Yes, what else? One of the strengths, there's no bias from like human input or like memory. Uh, okay. Remember like what you were doing at the time. There's no memory bias, so the labels can be very reliable. If indeed it is clear in the image what is going on, you can get reliable labels, but it harms privacy. And another uh, consideration, which I think is very important, is the added equipment. This, these cameras are not natural to wear, they're uncomfortable, so they create an unnatural behavior. And that kind of defeats part of the purpose of collecting in the wild data. So uh, the alternative is to use self-reporting. And with self-reporting, there have been different approaches suggested. One of them is self-reporting in situ, meaning at the moment, in real time. And for that person, uh, for that purpose, uh, researchers designed this, these simple interfaces where the person could select an activity from a list and mark when they're starting, mark when they're ending the activity. And another approach is self-reporting by recall. When you think back on your past activity, and that may be uh, prone to memory bias, like you mentioned. So there are different solutions to try to avoid that memory bias. And one of the solutions, like in this work by Consolvo, this work called UbiFit Garden, I'll mention it later again, they had a system with a combination of automatic recognition and manual labeling. Excuse me. So they used the mobile sensing platform that I mentioned before. That platform was working in the background and continuously uh, recognizing activities like walking and cycling. And the interface of the app was, had this daily history view where the person could view their own history. And in addition, they could manually edit and provide their own correct labels. So in our solution, we developed, Kat and myself developed the extrasensory app. That's the icon of the app. You'll get more familiar with it. And this app <coughs> is scheduled every minute to collect 20 seconds a window of sensor measurements from various sensors on the phone and on the watch. Then it sends these sensors to the cloud, to our server, where there's a very simple AI component. And that predicts or 
gives, responds with a very basic guess of what is going on, just a single label out of seven different options of body posture or movement states. And these are presented back to the user in a history view, like the interface we just saw. It, you had a question? No, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> You're free to ask questions if something is not clear. Um, okay, that was the easy part of the, of the app, the recording of the sensors. It's easy because it's automatic. Every minute it's get done automatic. The hard challenge, as I mentioned before, is how to engage the users to actually contribute data. A label, to contribute labels about themselves, about their own behavior. And uh, we wanted to collect plenty of labeled minutes and we wanted to collect detailed labels with combinations of relevant context labels. So we designed the self-reporting labeling interface with many different mechanisms so that it'll be easier for the participants to contribute as many labels with minimal uh, interaction or minimal effort one of these mechanisms was the history view, where they could see the guesses with these question marks, the guesses from the, from the server. By clicking one uh, row, they could get this form where they could edit the labels, they could change the prediction to sitting, and they can add more fine detailed uh, labels, like I'm at home and I'm, I was eating at the time. Uh, we call these secondary activities, even though they don't have to be activities, they can be locations like at home or company like with parents, with family, with friends. Now as I mentioned we were interested in a very wide range of behaviors so we also had to add some features to make it easy as possible for the participant to find the relevant labels quickly. So we had these different uh, quick links and the link for frequently used labels. So history was one mechanism to do reporting by recall, by recalling your past day or even yesterday. And we also allow for in situ reporting. We called it active feedback. By pressing this button, they can start initiate, uh, they can actively initiate to report that, for example, I'll be driving, I'm the driver, I'll be in a car, I'll be with family, and this context is going to stay relevant for the next 25 minutes. And I can just leave the phone in the pocket and concentrate on actually doing what I'm doing, driving. And another uh, mechanism to report was notifications, where the app itself triggered these notifications or questions to the user that would appear both on the phone and on the watch. And in case it asked, are you still doing this and that? And the answer is yes, it will be very easy to just respond with a click of a button. So these are the, this was the interface to make it easier for them to provide labels, but there's another component of effort in this study of actually collecting the data. So Kat and myself recruited 60 participants. With each one of them we, we installed the app on their personal phone and we provided the watch and they participated from on average seven days each. They had to sign a consent form. There was also a monetary compensation component to it. And part of the compensation was fixed. Part of it depended on the amount of label data that they contributed. We uh, curated the extrasensory data set. It has over 300,000 labeled minutes and labeled with a variety of over 50 different context labels from different aspects of behavior. And these were rich uh, annotations. So on average, every example, every minute was labeled with more than three different context labels. So this is by far a larger data set than any of the previous data sets in the field. And we also wanted to provide it uh, publicly available. So it's available in this website, extrasensory.ucsd.edu for free. You can go there, read about it, download the data set, play with it and develop more methods for context recognition. <clears throat> to get a better feel of what's in the, in the data set and what we've been able to, to collect, a, let's look at some statistics. So using these different uh, reporting mechanisms, we were able to collect data from all different days of the week and all times of the day. Typically, we, we collected users uh, used the app less during the weekend they preferred doing whatever is fun to them, but 
uh, still we managed to collect a lot of, lab of, lot of uh, minutes even during the weekend. Overall, the history tab marked here in the yellow, in, sorry, in the green, was the most popular mechanism to report. It yielded the most minutes, uh, labeled minutes. But um, um, on peak hours, like afternoon and evening hours, people utilized more the other mechanisms, like marking on the watch uh, to confirm notifications, or using the active feedback to report what you're about to do. So using these different mechanisms, we were able to support different uh, contextual situations, like sleeping. 53 people reported sleeping for more than 80,000 minutes. And obviously, most of these minutes were reported using the history. The person would first sleep, and then in the morning, they would report that they slept uh, the past few hours. But other activities that are more pre-planned, like getting on a bus or running, the users utilize more the active feedback, so they can report, I'm about to be running for 20 minutes. <clears throat> uh, OK, I talked about data collection, and I'll talk now briefly about validation with data. So you need to validate the, the performance of the system so that you can declare how well the system performs. And it's important to separate the training set from the test set, or even separate the training participants from the test participants, and then to find some uh, fair metric to, to look at as a score. Um, now, these are results from the second paper with the MLP, with the multilayer perceptron. And this indicates, the x-axis indicates the size of the hidden layer. So the larger the hidden layer, the richer the model, and it's able to express more patterns. This is the score, the higher the better. And this is the train score. So how well the system is able to recognize the context of the training examples, the same examples we used for training. So obviously, the richer the model, or the bigger the model, or more parameters you have to fine tune, the better that you can fit the training set. But we realized that this is not the objective that we're really interested in. We need to test how well the system performs on new unseen examples. So we have to evaluate the test score. And we can see that when you increase the size of the model, the performance on the test score uh, improves until a certain point where it starts to degrade. And this is what's called overfitting, when your model overfits to the particular examples in the training set. Any questions? OK. <clears throat> next, next, let's talk about the application. What is context recognition useful for? What can you do with it? And this is relevant to your uh, application, your class projects in this class. So I will briefly mention two examples of previous studies. First one is UbiFit Garden by Consolvo and her company and her uh, collaborators. In this application, they recognized context and the purpose was to promote physical activity or to promote a balanced physical activity with weight training and with cardio workout and with stretching. So they used context recognition automatic in the background. And they had this graphical interface uh, that depended on the amount of activity that you did. So the more exercise you did, the more flowers you'd get. And that would incentivize the participant to do more exercise. Another example application is music recommendation. And in this work, they tried to tie different aspects, the context, the user, and the music. So to make the music recommendation first personalized to the user based on their personality traits and preferences, and also context aware, based and relevant to the current context. <coughs> and before I go to talk about your own project, here are the references. Again, if you saw something interesting, please look up the reference and go read the paper. Yes? To record speech? Yeah, for uh, That is a possibility. We didn't do it yet in that work. We didn't, well, the question was about uh, to record, like, I'm about to run for 20 minutes. Is that what you meant? Yeah, or I was running for. Yes, that's another 
a technique that is possible to collect labels. Uh, we, di we didn't do it. It requires work to implement it and uh, it requires that later either the person or some other person uh, transcribes the recordings or you use some uh, speech recognition, automatic speech recognition tools. So speech recognition tools are getting more and more um, popular and better performing. So I'm sure that would be a tool to collect labels in the wild and in the future. <coughs> now, let's talk about your own project. So, in your class project, you are going to design and implement an exciting application that uses context recognition. Um, specifically, you will be required to provide the application would need to provide some kind of visualization to the user about their own behavior. And there are many different ways you can do it. You can display statistics over, uh, over the whole week, over the whole day of their activity. You can present different behaviors on a timeline or on a map. You'll also get location coordinates so you can present behaviors on a geographic map or whatever brilliant you, idea that you have to convey this behavioral information to the user in a clear, interesting, and fun way. And of course, your application will have to provide some added value. So think, why would anyone want to use that application? Why will that be useful? In addition, you'll do some basic evaluation. We realize you don't have time in the scope of this class to do a thorough evaluation, but you can still do some simulations and perhaps use a single or few uh, users, test users, and the more successful, exciting applications that you come up with, uh, Professor Bible and myself would be happy to continue working with you and researching and possibly doing evaluation with actual real users. In order to do your, uh, to develop your application, you're going to use the extrasensory app. Now before I presented this app as a tool to collect label data in the wild, but in your projects, you're going to use it as a black box tool that provides you real-time context recognition. So in order to get that improvement, we had to put in some improvements to the system. So the sensors, you can now select which sensors to record so that you can burn less battery. And the AI component on the cloud is improved now. It's trained on the whole data set with 60 subjects. So it's, it's much more accurate and it's more detailed. It provides now predictions for 51 different context recognition, uh, context labels. So for each minute, it provides probability estimates for these 51 different labels. So how are you going to use it? Just keep the app, extra sensory app, running in the background on an Android phone. It's an Android app. And you're supposed to get approximately every minute, you'll be getting prediction probabilities for these 51 different context labels. And in addition, you'll also get uh, location coordinates for each minute, assuming that the location services were on at the time. Um, so now I'd like to dedicate a few minutes for you to actually think of ideas for applications because you'll need to do it in the coming week. To, in this week, you'll need to form teams. By next week, you'll need to have concrete application ideas. <clears throat> so when you think of defining your application, Think what it does and what, why would anyone want to use it, why it's useful or desirable. <clears throat> Think who will be the potential users. It doesn't have to be for everyone. It can be for a particular, particular group of people. And when will they use it? Does it have to be on all the time? Does it have to be on at particular times? And think also a little bit about how will it work? How will it utilize the recognized context in order to provide the added value. So you can assume that you're getting perfect recognition from extra sensories. Assume that every minute you're getting probabilities for these 51 different labels. And I would like you to take a few minutes to think of ideas, and then we can shout out the ideas. Are those the labels that the extra sensory have for Yes.
Did any ideas any come up? Is two minutes enough? Yeah. I'm not sure if it's in the scope or not, but this is based on another app called um, Sweatcoin in the UK. It's really picked up recently. It uses your phone's movement, and as you're walking and running around, it converts your movement into this like cryptocurrency, which you can use to buy and sell things on their marketplace. Uh -huh. Are they sending that to other apps in real life that aren't just <coughs> movement? Because you can get all these labels, like, you know, you can reward people for going, going to class or doing chores and things like that. Okay, so you're suggesting using the automatic tracking of various activities so that a person will try to collect more recorded minutes and that would give them some kind of currency that they can use to... What are they using it for, <laughs> the currency? In the... In the, app. in the British app. Um, it's an online, it's, like a, it's used like blockchain and paper cryptocurrency, which is used in this online marketplace. Online marketplace. That's an interesting idea. Okay. Save that for Piazza. Yes. Well, I, wa I always was thinking about the application that would know what you're doing and based on, on what you're doing, it will play uh, music for you. So okay. Like if, so you, you, if you're like sleeping, it's just like playing the list of music you pick for sleeping. And if you're like studying, it will like play those music. So you, so it would be like automatic. It would like guess what you're doing and based on that choose. The okay, music. so you're suggesting music recommendation, which is context aware, like uh, applications that we discussed. You can go for that idea and think of more details. How are you going to utilize these particular contexts, and how will you make this particular app more desirable for users? Yes. Uh, you use it for smarter ads. Smarter ads. So this sounds like uh, your customer is going to be a company in itself, right? That would like to purchase your app. <laughs> That's also an idea. Uh, I, I, to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I mean, it was general ads. Okay, so advertisements can be context aware as well. And that's a direction that many companies are uh, interested in how to put the correct, the relevant advertisement at the relevant time or for the relevant person. So you can utilize also recognized uh, contexts in order to provide the relevant ads. Yes? Um, I was just curious, um, before I say my idea, can you also um, get sensor fusion data directly into your app, or is it only the predictions that your app has access to? Within the scope of this class, you'll have that particular interface. So what you will get from extrasensory is the probabilities for these labels and uh, location coordinates. So not the internal details. But if you would like to continue a more deeper research, then you can work on the more internal mechanisms of the extrasensory app and have access to the raw sensor measurements. So in, in, in light of that, I was thinking about Okay, so these are more suggestions like detecting a car accident or detecting when you're in a class to change the behavior of the phone to automatically mute it. Yes? Um, my idea is because we have all these 51 uh, data points, so a lot of currently in like, America, like, we have common strokes and heart attacks, and a lot of it comes down to habits overlapping for years. So, like, maybe the app could. Um, like, instead of telling someone, oh, you should use better and then, like, work out, it's not going to be able to help them. But having data from, a, from your own phone can maybe potentially help people realize what bad habits they have to do. Which I'm always sitting down, or only eating, they never, never go outside, they're always at home, or they're always like, at home. Okay, and so. And can potentially tell them from a year of big, year of big data, like, that they are just very Okay, so you're targeting the health domain and health monitoring or regular life behavior monitoring to promote 
healthier uh, lifestyle. Yeah. And that's a very popular research uh, domain that a lot of researchers are going for. That's an idea. And for this class, if you pursue such an application, you have to think more specific and provide exact details of what you plan this specific application to do and why that application is going to be useful in that field. Sure. I was also thinking of doing something like a health monitoring app, but turning it into like a game. So like you, uh, at the beginning you say, you know, how often you want to run a week or, or uh, cycle a week or how often you want to be at work or class or anything. And okay. You have, like a village or something. And so like if you don't do those activities, you know, you get negative re repercussions in the game or positive repercussions. Okay, that's another great idea of how to make that application more desirable or more useful, more used by the users by making it into a game or setting your goals and trying to achieve them. Okay, let's have the last uh, yeah. suggestion. This is a bit more of a boring idea, but it's definitely something I'd use. Basically, just log all of these activities that I'm doing so I can triage them later and then maybe provide some insights on uh, you've been shopping too much or mm -hmm. spend too much, or like you could use the stairs or something. Okay, so you, um, one option is to log it for a longer time, log all these uh, behaviors for a longer time so that after a week, a month, you can get some report. And um, for this class project, you'll be, have to be more specific. What exactly do you want to do with this report and what will you use it for? Why will that be useful? But you, uh, you can take that idea and develop it. Okay, so what's next? Go to Piazza, keep thinking about these ideas, talk to each other, develop these ideas, uh, mention them in Piazza and collect responses and develop these ideas. You'll have to form teams by the end of this week and uh, by the end of next week, you'll have to have concrete proposals that you submit to um, Gradescope. Um, okay, I think this is it from myself and Professor, you had other comments? Yes. So let's thank Jonathan first. So thank you. Okay. Thank you.